Good morning and a very warm welcome to you this morning on this 19th Sunday of Trinity. Let us worship God together, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So let's pray together. Lord, direct our thoughts and teach us to pray. Lift up our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we sing together. My sins forgiven, my heart made clean. The grace of heaven poured out on me. I stand in awe of this, I stand in awe of him, that he would draw. And now we have the collect, the special prayer for today. Faithful Lord, whose steadfast love never ceases and whose mercies never come to an end, grant us the grace to trust you and to receive the gifts of your love new every morning. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we have our prayers of penitence. As we confess together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. 
We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love and wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we have our reading from Mark 10. Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. As Jesus was starting on his way, a man ran up, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to receive eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not accuse anyone falsely. Do not cheat. Respect your father and your mother. Teacher, the man said, ever since I was young, I have obeyed all these commandments. Jesus looked straight at him with love and said, You need only one thing. Go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor, and you will have riches in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the man heard this, gloom spread over his face, and he went away sad because he was very rich. Jesus looked round at his disciples and said to them, How hard it will be for rich people to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were shocked at these words, but Jesus went on to say, My children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is much harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. At this, the disciples were completely amazed and asked one another, who then can be saved? Jesus looked straight at them and answered, This is impossible for human beings, but not for God. Everything is possible for God. Then Peter spoke up, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Yes, Jesus said to them, And I tell you that anyone who leaves home, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or fields for me, and for the gospel, will receive much more in this present age. He will receive a hundred times more houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, and persecutions as well. And in the age to come, he will receive eternal life. But many who now are first will be last, and many who now are last will be first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
So thanks, Val, for reading that well-known scripture passage from Mark's Gospel. And it is one of the most well-known passages about wealth. But for me, it's also one of the most confusing. So why does Jesus compare the wealthy with camels? And is he really saying that the rich won't make it into heaven? The scene takes place in Judea where Jesus has just finished an illustration about welcoming children into his kingdom. We pick this up in Mark 10 verses 13 to 14 and it says this, And Jesus called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you're converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Now, a rich young man comes up to Jesus and asks him how to inherit eternal life. Jesus tells the young man to keep God's commandments, which the man quickly claims to have kept. So what do I still lack, he asks. And Jesus answered him and said, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now, when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, what's immediately obvious is that camels are far too large to fit through the eye of a needle. It's ridiculous to even suggest it. So what's the meaning of that verse? Was Jesus really saying that rich people can't enter the kingdom of God? So let's look more closely at the passage to see what we can learn. Now, if Jesus was talking about an actual camel and an actual needle, then the rich are in really big trouble. Commentary suggests that he may have been saying something different. The Aramaic word for rope, camelon, was almost identical to the Greek word for camel, Camelon, camelon, which appears in the verse. Some scholars say that the word was misspelled, and so Jesus may have been making an analogy to threading a thick rope through the eye of a needle, not a large animal. In other words, he may have been referring to something extremely difficult, but not impossible. And other commentators suggest that at the time there was a type of small gate called a needle in the wall of Jerusalem. Still, others insist that Jesus' statement was as absurd as it sounds, actually referring to our same notions of camels and needles. There are several potential explanations for what camels and needles could have meant in biblical times. However, all of them point to the same lesson. Jesus said, it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, for a rich person to enter his kingdom. And in fact, when the disciples then speculate that no one can be saved, Jesus replies, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Jesus himself settles the question. He was intentionally referring to something impossible to make them think. So, here are the camels. So if you're listening to this and thinking of the rich as billionaires who lead the FTSE 100 or FTSE 250 companies on the London Stock Exchange, you may need to reset your idea of wealth. Worldwide statistics show that, in fact, if you have a family joint income of more than £50,000 annually, you probably join the list of the world's wealthiest people and are in the global 1%. Now, compared to others in your geographical area, you might consider yourself to be middle class, or your income may even hover near your local poverty line. But 
if you know how to read and write, if your home has electricity, and if you own a TV, a computer or a smartphone, you are probably still in the top tier of the world's most wealthy people. Understanding ourselves as wealthy changes our mindset. Rather than seeing Jesus as teaching about wealth as a lesson for others, we really need to examine ourselves. So can you enter through the eye of a needle? Let's not forget that Jesus did give the rich young man an option. It was that man's choice not to sell his possessions and give to the poor. And notably, Jesus begins his instruction with, if you want to be perfect. So as believers in the Bible, we actually understand that we can never be perfect. In fact, Jesus came because we can never earn our way into heaven. But still, Jesus was giving the man a test of his willingness to follow God, and the man didn't obey. Jesus saw that the young man's heart, heart was not completely devoted to God. He was keeping all the rules, but his response to Jesus' command revealed that he hadn't taken the action of following Jesus. If Jesus asked the same of you, what do you think you would do? Now, wealth has a curious effect on the human heart, and far from being neutral about the way we use our money, God devotes many words of scripture to help us develop a proper heart posture toward it. And in fact, the Bible mentions money, wealth, and possessions over 2,000 times. And in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus points out that money and God are rivaling masters. In Matthew 6, 24, it says, you cannot serve both God and money. In other words, if you love money, you will despise God. So is money bad? Scripture never says so, although it does say that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. We don't see prohibitions about earning, using or saving money. And Proverbs 21.20 tells us that the wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. But you know, wealth is a ferocious master, but it can also be an excellent servant. So here's a hard question. Do you control your finances or do your finances control you? On the other hand, we can't ignore that in Scripture being part of the kingdom of heaven is linked to financial generosity, especially for those who are rich. And when the wealthy tax collector Zacchaeus followed Jesus, he pledged to give half of his possessions to the poor in Luke 19, verse 8. In Jesus' parable of the unnamed rich man and the beggar Lazarus, the rich man who did not show generosity to Lazarus found himself in eternal torment in Luke 16, verses 19 to 31. Zacchaeus' treasure was in heaven, and so he was generous with his treasure on earth. The rich man's treasure was on earth, and he was left without an inheritance in heaven. I wonder, have you ever seen those messages on Google or on your internet banking? You know, the one that's entitled Wealth Check. Kingdom currency operates in a different way to the, world, the way the world thinks about wealth. So let's have a look and rethink our wealth. If we're rich and Jesus is warning of the dangers of riches, what can we take away from this passage? So number one, check your dependency. Are your thoughts focused on God? or on money and possessions. So you could try this exercise. Think of something you're hoping to purchase soon. Do you need it or do you want it? If it's something you just want, do you believe that the purchase will bring you happiness? Could you be content in Christ even if you don't buy it? 
Secondly, we have much to learn from those in poverty. If wealth obscures our view of God, poverty can bring it into sharp focus. Seeking out opportunities to spend time with people who experience daily dependence on God's provision can be a humbling experience. And you may be surprised to know that there are people in our church who daily depend on God's provision. You only have to look around. There are homeless people all around us, even in the UK. There are people who sleep in tubes tube stations until they moved on. There are homeless people sleeping in doorways of shops. And the amount of homelessness is often hidden because people are able to sofa surf. In other words, sometimes they can rely on a mate so they can sleep on their floor or their sofa for a night or two. Can you imagine what it must feel like as a mum or dad to be unable to feed your children? and need to use the food bank. But praise God that it's there, and thank you to everybody who makes a contribution, however small or large. And that's before we even consider what may be happening in the developing world. That's why charities like Compassion, Mercy Ships, MAF, UNICEF, Water Aid, and many others need our help. Thirdly, use your wealth for good. It's a simple concept that pays powerful dividends for the posture of our hearts. Jesus told the rich young man to give up his wealth to the poor, not to throw it in the Jordan River. He's asking us to come with him with the perspective that all we have belongs to him. Whatever God asks us to do with what we have, I suggest that our answer needs to be yes, Lord. Finally, fourthly, thank God for making a way so that even the wealthy can approach his throne. Jesus said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And used in the right way, wealth is not only a blessing to us, but it's a blessing that we can steward God's finances to bless the kingdom at large. Amen. And let's affirm our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. And on the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And Fiona is going to bring us our prayers of intercession. We are reminded in the Psalms, the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest on us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Those are words from Psalm 33. I've divided our intercessory prayers for today into five short sections. Firstly, prayers for the church. Lord, we thank you for your church worldwide. We pray that your name would be honoured and glorified in it. We ask that your church would be open to hear from you. We commit those in leadership and positions of responsibility within your church, asking that you would guide them and protect them in their roles. Amen. 
Secondly, prayers for the world. Lord, we thank you for your wonderful creation. We are concerned about the damage being caused by climate change. Please make us mindful of our individual responsibilities to minimise damage to the planet. We pray too for the world leaders gathering in Glasgow for the climate conference later this month and for Alok Sharma, president of this meeting. Please give them wisdom and boldness in their discussions and decisions. Amen. Thirdly, Lord, we bring before you the country and the people of Afghanistan. We pray for those living there in this unsettled time, asking that their physical and emotional needs would be met. We pray too for those who have fled from the country, asking that they would find welcome and security. Amen. Fourthly, we pray for concerns within our own country. We thank you, Lord, for the National Health Service and pray, that, and pray for those working within it. We ask for wisdom for the continued management of COVID and pray for those whose NHS care has been delayed due to the pandemic. We thank you too, Lord, for the welfare system in this country. We pray for a fair distribution of these resources and particularly ask that the needs would be met of those who have been affected by the withdrawal in this last week of the Universal Credit Uplift. Amen. Finally, we pray for those known to us personally. Please, in a quiet moment, pray for those for whom you have particular concern at this time. Lord, please care for and bless those we have mentioned. Amen. We offer these prayers to you, God and Father, confident that you hear and respond. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now we sing our final song. It's all I have but you deserve 
deserve my everything Forever I will say Thank you, thank you Thank you for the cross Now I love you, Jesus You have won my heart This is love This is love And as our service comes to an end, let us bless the Lord and say together, thanks be to God, blessing, honour and glory be yours here and everywhere, now and forever. Amen. Let's say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>